Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. Former President Donald Trump, Republican presidential candidate, campaigns in Grand Rapids, Michigan, on what he calls Biden's border bloodbath. President Joe Biden, Democratic presidential candidate, says it's outrageous that the Florida Supreme Court has allowed a six-week abortion ban to take effect in that state. C-SPAN interviewed two more presidential candidates earlier today, Democrat Marianne Williamson and Independent Cornell West. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announces a new railroad safety rule requiring all trains to have at least two crew members. Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell says he expects the federal government to pay for the lion's share of rebuilding the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, as Maryland Governor Wes Moore says that two temporary shipping channels are now open into Baltimore Harbor. Israel's prime minister takes responsibility for an airstrike in Gaza that killed seven aid workers with Chef Jose Andres' group World Central Kitchen, calling it a tragic event and saying there will be an investigation. We'll get reaction from Secretary of State Antony Blinken, White House spokesperson John Kirby, and Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh. And President Joe Biden speaks by phone with Chinese President Xi Jinping about Taiwan, fentanyl, and artificial intelligence, a call that the White House says was candid and constructive. And we start with former President Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican presidential nominee this year, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, talking about immigration and border security. The Trump campaign previewing this stop, saying that the candidate would talk about Biden's border bloodbath and that Joe Biden's violent criminal illegals are invading backyards and communities across Michigan, resulting in death, destruction, and chaos. President Donald Trump, former President Trump, did not shy away from that language. They're sending prisoners, murderers, drug dealers, mental patients, and terrorists, the worst they have in every country all over the world. This isn't just in South America. They're coming from the Congo, from Yemen, from Somalia, from Syria, they come from all over the world, China. They're, many of them are military age, which is a very strange, you don't see very many women coming in, and you see a lot of them coming in at about 19 to 25, 26 years old, and especially from China, we have 29,000 over the last few months, 29,000 from China, and they all seem to be uh, perfectly fit for military service, ready for military service, it's crazy. This is country changing, it's country threatening, and it's country wrecking. They have wrecked our country. But I stand before you today to declare that Joe Biden's border bloodbath, and that's what it is, it's a bloodbath. They tried to use that term incorrectly on me two weeks ago. You know, it's all about misinformation. That's all they do is cheat on elections and disinformation, misinformation, fairly closely related, those two words. But they basically mean that uh, it's all talk. But it's a border bloodbath, and it's destroying our country. It's a very bad thing happening. It's going to end on the day that I take office, which will be January 20th. It'll end. A Washington Examiner article has this paragraph. Donald Trump's visit comes 10 days after Grand Rapids resident Ruby Garcia, 25 years old, was murdered. Her boyfriend, Brandon Ortiz Vite, a 25-year-old illegal immigrant from Mexico, has been arrested as the primary suspect in her death and was arraigned in court last Tuesday. Ortiz Vite faces charges of felony murder, open murder, carjacking, carrying a concealed weapon, and felony firearm. That was from the Washington Examiner. Donald Trump spoke about this case. Moments ago, I met with an incredible group of local law enforcement leaders to discuss how Michigan communities are being ravaged by a new form of crime, and that's the migrant crime that we name it. It should be called Biden migrant crime, but that's too long. But you'll always remember it was Biden that gave it to us. Eleven days ago, right here in Kent County, a 25-year-old Michigan woman named Ruby Garcia, who's become a very well-known name, beautiful young woman, was savagely murdered by an illegal alien criminal. Under the Trump administration, this monster had been deported, thrown out of the country, wasn't going to be able to come back because you just have to look at the charts. It was very, very hard to get in. But he came back, and uh, we threw him out of the country, and crooked Joe Biden took him back and let him back in and let him stay in, and he, he viciously killed Ruby. The illegal alien charged with Ruby's really heinous killing and This is somebody that had many, many arrests, including for 
some very bad crimes that he committed. And he was set loose to roam our streets, and in this case, uh, set loose to roam in Michigan by politicians that are left and weak and stupid. On March 22nd, he shot 17-year-old Ruby. Actually, she was uh, a beautiful, beautiful young woman. Uh, Ruby Garcia was uh, shot multiple times with an illegally obtained handgun. Her body was dumped on the side of a highway, left to die, actually. Had a little life left, left to die. And uh, Ruby passed away, and it's been a big story because it's so horrible. Some of these horrible stories, there's so many of them. You could go on for days, but some of them just, uh, they resonate so much more. For whatever reason, they're all so horrible, and there's so many of them. Now Ruby's loved ones and community are left grieving for this incredible young woman, remembering what they called her. They said she had just this most contagious laughter. And when she walked into a room, she lit up that room. And I've heard that from so many people. I spoke to some of her family. Former President Donald Trump, 2024 Republican presidential candidate and likely nominee of his party today in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He also said we'll begin, if he's elected, the largest domestic deportation operation in the history of our country. The White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre was asked at her news conference at the White House today in Washington for President Biden's take about Donald Trump's focus on border security and immigration. We discussed earlier former President Trump is describing the situation on the border as a bloodbath. But on Friday, we're going to get jobs figures and past jobs reports have shown that immigrants are helping the U.S. economy. Is the view of this administration that the inflow of immigrants do more to strengthen the United States or hurt the United States? Does it do more? So, Josh, I appreciate the question, and I think it's an important uh, question as we're hearing uh, clearly awful rhetoric uh, from the other side. Uh, so, but what we know, what this president believes, uh, and you've heard this president say this before, is that we know immigrants strengthen our country uh, and our economy as well. It goes hand in hand here. Uh, think about the critical work, eight immigrants. These eight immigrants were doing on Key Bridge when it collapsed, when it collapsed. While Congress failed to act on President Biden's comprehensive immigration reform, remember he introduced that on the first day of his administration because he understood the importance of fixing, uh, fixing uh, immigration, uh, a system that had been broken, that has been broken for decades. Uh, his administration has led the largest expansion of lawful immigration pathways in decades, and we continue. We continue to work ensure employers and immigrants can effectively navigate the laws in place. And so reforming our immigration system only strengthens our economy. You hear the president talking about that, about making sure that we have an economy that works for everyone, making sure that there's dignity and respect for everyone. And so, and by doing that, it boosts our labor uh, supply, it helps solve workforce shortages, and some uh, businesses are facing, right? Uh, that we see businesses are facing. And so we took a step forward not too long ago. We spent two months working with the Senate, working with Republicans and Democrats to try and figure out how do we deal with this broken system. We saw, they, we put together what would have been, if put into law, the toughest and fairest uh, piece of legislation that we have seen in some time. But what we heard from the last, last administration from President Trump, and you heard me say this over and over again, you all reported this, that he told Republicans to reject that proposal because it would hurt him and help the president. That's not how this president sees this. This president sees the immigration system as an as a issue that majority of Americans care about and that we should fix. We should get to the bottom of this. So we're going to continue to urge uh, Congress, Republicans, to come back, right? Get come back to the table, move forward with that proposal, get it out of the Senate, and then move it over to this house, the House. Get it out of the House, put it in front of the in front of the president. He will sign it. The toughest and fairest law that we have seen in some time. And this is not about politics for this president. And to just to go back to the beginning of, of answering your question, we know immigrants strengthen our country and also strengthen our economy. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre at her news conference today at the White House. Washington Times reports the Democratic National Committee erected billboards in Michigan accusing former President Donald Trump of causing the border chaos by blowing up an immigration deal on Capitol Hill. 
It is the latest attempt by President Biden and his Democrats to shift the blame for the mess at the U.S.-Mexico border, an issue that threatens to hurt Mr. Biden's re-election bid. That's how the Washington Times puts it. This is Washington Today. President Joe Biden is calling the decision by the Florida Supreme Court to allow a six-week abortion ban to take effect outrageous. He says in a statement, yesterday's extreme decision puts desperately needed medical care even further out of reach for millions of women in Florida and across the South. The justices in Florida also allowed a proposed constitutional amendment to protect abortion rights to appear on the November ballot. An AFP article on this subject has This, the decision by the Southern state's conservative-dominated court on Monday threw Florida into the heart of an increasingly bitter nationwide fight over reproductive rights ahead of November's U.S. presidential election. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre also discussed this. So yesterday, the Florida Supreme Court upheld the state's dangerous abortion ban, putting desperately needed medical care further out of reach for millions of women. What's worse... This ruling is also expected to trigger Governor DeSantis's even more extreme ban that would prevent women from accessing care before many even know they are pregnant. We will continue to stand with the vast majority of Americans who support a woman's right to choose. President Biden and Vice President Harris will continue to work to protect reproductive freedom and call on Congress to pass a law restoring the protections of Roe v. Wade. The White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, Republican presidential candidate and former President Donald Trump, was asked at his stop in Grand Rapids, Michigan, about what was happening in Florida. He said, we'll be making a statement next week on abortion. We're going to make a statement next week on abortion. And after the Florida Supreme Court ruling on Monday, the Biden-Harris re-election campaign manager, Julie Chavez-Rodriguez, put out a memo saying the president was in a stronger position to win Florida this cycle than he was in 2020, and the state was now winnable for Democrats. Back in 2020, Republican Donald Trump beat Democrat Joe Biden in Florida 51 percent to 48 percent. C-SPAN interviewed two other presidential candidates this morning, author Marianne Williamson, a Democrat, and professor and activist Cornel West, an independent. Marianne Williamson had suspended her campaign after her low single-digit percentage vote totals in the early primary states, but a few weeks ago unsuspended her campaign to re-enter the race. I suppose you've heard them from people, if the president, <clears throat> if president Biden does have the delegates, why not just go ahead and support him and, and keep going that way? Well, I'm, I, I believe that I am supporting the president because I am talking about the things that I believe the Democratic Party needs to stand for in order to win. You know, Franklin Roosevelt said that we wouldn't have to worry about a, a fascist takeover in this country as long as democracy delivers on its promises. Democracy is not delivering on its promises. We are not, the Democrats are not going to win in 2024 by scolding people or shaming people who don't agree with everything they're saying. And they're not going to win just by scaring people about Donald Trump. This is going to be more like 2016 than 2020. What we need to do is to stand for the traditional pillars of the Democratic Party, which is unequivocal advocacy for the working people of the United States. That would mean universal health care. Don't tell me that you believe in, in health care as a right and not just a privilege when you have 75 to 90 million people who are underinsured or uninsured. We need to stand for Medicare for all. We need to stand for subsidized child care, for tuition-free college and tech school, all of which are considered moderate positions in every other European, every other advanced democracy. Why do you think that uh, <clears throat> this president hasn't delivered on those things? Because he takes an incremental approach. Uh, he wants to ameliorate the stress of people, certainly, but uh, the corporatist democratic establishment leadership elite will only go so far. They, they will not go past the line at which then they, they uh, challenge the underlying profit maximization goals of insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, big food companies, big chemical companies, um, big agricultural companies, gun manufacturers, although the Democrats will take on the, the gun lobby, um, uh, big oil and defense contractors. And that is the corruption of Washington, and people know it. Marianne Williamson, Democratic presidential candidate, on this morning's Washington Journal on C-SPAN. Another guest this morning on C-SPAN was independent presidential candidate Cornell West. And I'm just trying to do the best that I can to raise my voice, to mobilize people, and to get people to see that Trump's leading us toward a second civil war and Biden's leading us toward a third world war. And we've got to do better than those two 
in terms of an option at this particular moment in the history of this country. If, if you were president, then what would a Cornell West uh, uh, administration do to change the, the plight of poor people specifically than others have promised or, and I guess in your opinion, haven't delivered yet? Well, I mean, Biden has just authorized $200 billion for, for B-21 bombers. We could, we could abolish poverty with a little over $200 billion. I, I'm an abolitionist when it comes to poverty, just like Martin King. I'm an abolitionist when it comes to homelessness. I just spent wonderful time with my brothers and sisters there on the uh, East Side Cafe here in, in Los Angeles at El Sereno uh, Community Garden. No housing. I was just a skid row with, with Master Q in Los Angeles. Skid Row has thousands and thousands of people. How can we be the richest nation in the history of the world and have so many poor people and homeless people? Well, we got organized greed in the real estate industry. You got organized greed when it comes to housing, organized greed when it comes to health care, more and more organized greed when it comes to education. This is what happens when you have organized greed unleashed on a society with little accountability and the most vulnerable of those who are most affected. It's got to be a moral compass when you talk about leadership in the country. And you know that, that that's so true in regard to the genocide and the ethnic cleansing and the uh, uh, ugly apartheid-like conditions in Gaza. That's a fundamental moral litmus test. We sit there and watch it taking place and still enable more billions of dollars to allow the military equipment that we produce from our tax money to go to killing and maiming children, 13,000 precious Palestinian children, and we act as if we can do nothing. I mean, this is, this, is, this is spiritual sickness, my brother. It really is. And that's true for any people, no matter who it would be, black, white, red, Jewish, Lithuanian, or Ethiopian. Independent presidential candidate Cornell West on C-SPAN's Washington Journal program this morning. You can find the full segment with him and the one with Democratic presidential candidate Marianne Williamson at our video library, cspan.org. Today, there are presidential primaries in Connecticut, Delaware, Rhode Island, Wisconsin, and New York. From CBS News, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announced a new rule on Tuesday requiring two-person crews on railroads in a move to bolster safety as rail regulation has come into the spotlight after the East Palestine, Ohio derailment last year. The Federal Railroad Administration's provision establishes a minimum crew size for all railroads, including freight, passenger, and commuter trains requiring at least two crew members from CBS News. Secretary Buttigieg spoke at the Transportation Department in Washington, joined by the head of the Federal Railroad Administration. Also, rail workers were there and first responders. Some of these trains running through communities are about three miles long. For perspective, if you put the Empire State Building on its side and then added 11 more Empire State Buildings, that's about how big some of these trains would be. And they want to operate that with one person. Certainly can't imagine operating one Empire State Building with one person. And it doesn't move. It defies common sense, and that changes today. So on behalf of the Biden administration, our department is proud to issue this final rule requiring safe crew sizes for every train across America. And we're excited to celebrate that with you. That means that we finally have a general provision establishing minimum crew size for trains that should and from now on must have at least two crew members. A second crew member is vital to performing safety functions like securing a train with handbrakes, handling track switches that are not remotely controlled, obtaining track authorities, assisting in emergencies, and much more. Americans across the country commented on this rulemaking, including railroad workers who know firsthand why this rule is so important. Many described how the conductor and the engineer work together to help each other avoid dangerous situations and prevent accidents. One worker said asking a person to run a train alone for 12 plus hours is like a kind of solitary confinement that will inevitably, inevitably lead to fatigue. One worker said, we must have two-person train crews to stay alive in this job by looking out for each other, which is what America's railroad workers do. And workers described how when a train is blocking a road, which is a huge headache that we hear about again and again in communities, having a second crew member can also be helpful toward clearing that issue and moving more quickly, or even where necessary, cutting the train to unblock a crossing. 
Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg at the DOT headquarters in Washington, D.C. Again from the CBS News article, rail safety came into the spotlight in the aftermath of a train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio last year. Lawmakers introduced a bipartisan rail safety bill shortly after, which has long been delayed in the Senate, where it's unclear if enough Republican support exists for the measure to clear a filibuster. Since the East Palestine derailment, there have been more than 1,500 derailments in the United States. The president of the Washington, D.C. Firefighters Association, David Hoagland, said Tuesday, reporting from CBS News. Some updates on the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore one week ago when it was hit by that container ship that apparently lost power. Seven News out of Baltimore reporting the two temporary channels are now open for commercial traffic at the Port of Baltimore. That, that announcement from Maryland Governor Wes Moore in a press release on Monday, one channel on the northeast side of the collapse opened for commercial traffic. The other temporary channel opened Tuesday. Governor Moore saying rough weather has forced the team to pivot over the last 24 hours, but the mission and the work continues. And from the independent newspaper out of Great Britain, the owners of the Dolly ship have denied all responsibility for the deadly crash into the Francis Cock Key Bridge in Baltimore and are seeking a cap of $43.7 million for any lawsuit payouts. Maryland Governor Westmore was interviewed this morning on WIYY Radio in Baltimore. A lot of people obviously um, are inquiring about timelines, which I know is almost next to impossible to even give a timeline at this point. But, I mean, we got cranes on there, and they're moving hundreds of tons already. It's it's only, like Justin said, it's only been a week, and it's miraculous where we're at at this point. Is okay. there a timeline in the the near future where we can maybe get eyes on, like, hey, let's hope to have this channel open uh, you know, I don't know. Is it months? Where are we at? Yeah, I can, you know, I can tell you, it, it's definitely, uh, you know, it's definitely going to be a long road, especially when we consider uh, this situation that we have right now where we have the, the, you know, we have the river that is literally so full of debris and wreckage that the divers who are down there right now cannot see past a foot or two in front of them. That's how much debris is in that water right now. Um, and we do know, and we we're, we're grateful. We literally have the, the largest operable, uh, and, and available, uh, cranes on the East coast now, either in, uh, in Maryland or on their way to Maryland where, you know, just two days ago, we we're able to get 200 tons of steel out of the water. And just so people understand what we mean by 200 tons, that's the same weight of the Statue of Liberty. That's what came out two days ago. Uh, just yesterday, we began operations to get 350 tons uh, out of out of the river. So we are moving. Uh, we are really, really moving at um, at pretty at a pretty historic pace. And I'm proud of the work that everybody is doing because the way folks have responded. And this has been a 24/7 operation uh, where where we are moving as fast and as safe as humanly possible. But this is going to be a long road, uh, both to make sure we're clearing the channel and getting the port of Baltimore back open because we've got to get this port of Baltimore back open. Uh, but also making sure that we, we cannot lose focus on rebuilding that bridge. Governor Wes Moore, Democrat from Maryland this morning on WIYY radio in Baltimore. Estimates to repair and rebuild the key bridge in Baltimore range from $400 million to $2 billion. President Joe Biden has already said he wants the federal government to pay for all of it. Congressman Dan Muser, Republican from Pennsylvania, recently called that outrageous. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell on Monday told WHAS Radio in Louisville, Kentucky, how much he believes the federal government should cover. There's not going to be any issue with money for this Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. But then people say, well, they built it in five years. Why is it going to take 10 to get a new one? It's it's an odd situation. In situations like that, whether it's a hurricane and... uh, Florida or uh, an accident like this, uh, the federal government will step up and do the lion's share of it. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, Monday on a radio station in Louisville. The Senate returns from its recess, as does the U.S. House, next week. Wall Street today, the Dow down 396, NASDAQ down 156, S&P down 37. From CNBC, Cleveland Federal Reserve President Loretta Mester said Tuesday she still expects interest rate cuts this year, 
but ruled out the next policy meeting in May. Mester also indicated that the long-run path is higher than policymakers had previously thought. Her fellow policymaker, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly, also said Tuesday she expects cuts this year, but not until there's more convincing evidence that inflation has been subdued. From Reuters on Monday, Nippon Steel intends to pursue its proposed acquisition of U.S. steel and wants its deep roots in the United States to be recognized, its new president said. Remarks that come after U.S. President Joe Biden expressed opposition to the deal. The Japanese firm has agreed to buy U.S. steel for roughly $15 billion, but the deal faces an uphill battle to approval in a U.S. election year. That was from Reuters. Today, Jared Bernstein, chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, held a wide-ranging discussion about the economy and trade at the Council on Foreign Relations. About two-thirds into the program, an audience member asked about Nippon Steel, and then another audience member asked about economics versus foreign affairs. Mike Masetic, PBS Online NewsHour. Some of this has maybe been implicit in what you've said up to now, but I have not heard explicitly Two words, Nippon Steel. Where does this fit into the matrix that you've laid out for us? You know, I mean, I think one of the important things there is if you read the president's statement, which is unequivocal, so he, you know, a couple of paragraphs that answer your question, uh, he talked about uh, the role of an iconic American steel company. He talked about the role of, of the unions. And, you know, listen to the steel workers. Uh, we did. Um, and uh, you can evaluate whether their thoughts about this and what's best for them are right or wrong. Uh, but the president was clear uh, about uh, uh, the importance of, uh, of American steel and uh, respectful of the views of the steel workers. Yes, uh, here we go, right here. Henri. Thank you, Henri Baraki from the Council and Lehigh University. Jake Sullivan, in his foreign affairs piece, did something which was very unusual. He started off with the importance of economic policy as the most important issue. I mean, we, we've never seen a national security advisor put so much emphasis on economic policy. My question to you is, how does the bureaucracy at the White House respond to this? How, has, have you changed the way you, we do foreign policy in the sense that do you get more involved in foreign policy decision making? Is there a, is there a structure by which economic dis, uh, input is taken into account? Yeah, I, I told Jake that if he keeps giving economic speeches, I'm going to give a foreign policy speech. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's really going to wake up. Uh, I would say yes. <laughs> I would say simply put, yes. I mean, I think the uh, the uh, ability to buy, you know, the, the, the wisdom of, kind of bifurcating foreign policy and economic policy has never been bifurcated. I mean, Mike's worked in economic and foreign policy uh, connections, as has the NSC forever, so these are not, uh, you know, these are not separate tribes by a long shot. Uh, but I think that the political implications of pursuing what, you know, Lighthizer would call in his book just you know traditional trade policy for, you know on both sides uh, has proved to be uh, uh, politically destabilizing and so uh, we need to uh, implement the well, you know our belief is clearly we need to implement the kinds of of uh, intersections of good trade and good economic policy which very much has a worker centered base I mean I talked about union workers from Mexico in my speech so worker centered doesn't just mean uh, domestic when it comes to the international uh, space. And I think Jake was clear about that too. So um, I think that the uh, uh, connection between economic outcomes in a, uh, in, a, in a country that's gone through a China shock um, and has had you know, large and significant trade deficits since the mid-1970s, uh, to not connect that uh, uh, economics to politics uh, is, uh, you know, would be a political economy malpractice. So I'm glad that uh, we've um, uh, made that uh, connection. Jared Bernstein chairs the White House Council of Economic Advisors today at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there. I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? 
Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcasts and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. Chef Jose Andres posting on X about seven members of his aid organization killed in Gaza. Today, World Central Kitchen lost several of our sisters and brothers in an IDF airstrike in Gaza. I am heartbroken and grieving for their families and friends and our whole WCK family. These are people, angels I served alongside in Ukraine, Gaza, Turkey, Morocco, Bahamas, Indonesia. They are not faceless. They are not nameless. The Israeli government needs to stop this indiscriminate killing. It needs to stop restricting humanitarian aid, stop killing civilians and aid workers, and stop using food as a weapon. No more innocent lives lost. Peace starts with our shared humanity. It needs to start now. That was the post from Chef Jose Andres. He also said he's suspending aid operations of the World Central Kitchen in Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu putting out his own statement. Unfortunately, in the past day, there was a tragic event in which our forces unintentionally harmed noncombatants in the Gaza Strip. This happens in war. We are conducting a thorough inquiry and are in contact with the governments. We will do everything to prevent a recurrence. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken reacted to this news as he was holding a joint news conference in Paris with the French foreign minister. Let me also reiterate what Stéphane said about the attack on the World Food Kitchen um, members, uh, World Central Kitchen, excuse me. Um, First, uh, I can only say that for so many of us, We extend our condolences to the loved ones, to the families, the friends, the colleagues of those who lost their lives, as well as those who were injured. Uh, I spoke to Jose Andras just about uh, a week ago about the efforts that uh, World Central Kitchens engaged in in uh, in Gaza, as it is in many other conflict zones around the world, including in Ukraine. Uh, They have been doing extraordinary, brave work day in, day out, and critical work to try to make sure that people in need get what they need, starting with the most basic thing of all, food to survive. The victims of yesterday's strike join a record number of humanitarian workers who've been killed in this particular conflict. These people are heroes. They run into the fire, not away from it. They show the best of what humanity has to offer when the going really gets tough. They have to be protected. We shouldn't have a situation where people who are simply trying to help their fellow human beings are themselves at grave risk. Uh, We've spoken directly to the Israeli government about this particular incident. We've urged a swift, a thorough, an impartial investigation to understand exactly what happened. And as we have throughout this conflict, we've impressed upon the Israelis the absolute imperative of doing more to protect innocent civilian lives, be they Palestinian children, women and men, or be they aid workers, uh, as well as to get more humanitarian assistance to more people more effectively. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Paris, a joint news conference with the French foreign minister. The Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh got a question about this at her news conference at the Pentagon. And then on the World Central Kitchen strike, 
Has mm -hmm. Israel reached out to you to assure you that the weapons used to kill the World Central Kitchen aid workers were not provided by the U.S.? So on that first, um, I think just it should be uh, very clear that, um, you know, our hearts go out to those who lost their lives um, in that strike. These are um, humanitarian aid workers who are providing life-saving aid um, to Palestinians in Gaza. And, um, you know, the Israelis have taken responsibility for that strike. They are conducting an investigation. Um, there have been conversations at different levels from the department with Israeli counterparts. Um, I don't have more to share for you on the weapons that were used, um, but we are certainly engaging with the Israelis. Um, as you know, the secretary regularly engages with Minister Gallant. Um, I don't have a call to preview just yet, but um, when they do speak, I'm sure this will be something that comes up in conversation. Um, but we certainly welcome that the Israelis have opened up an immediate investigation into the incident. Does it change circumstances, particularly for the U.S. providing weapons, if it turns out that the weapons that were used to kill these aid workers were actually U.S. provided weapons, though? Well, again, I'm not going to get ahead of the investigation um, that the Israelis are conducting. Um, we've been very clear from the from the beginning since the war started, uh, since the Israelis conducted operations within Gaza, that they need to do everything possible to preserve um, innocent lives, Palestinian lives, the lives of humanitarian aid workers going in every single day, providing this type of care and, and service. Um, and they need to uphold those humanitarian laws. And that's something that, you know, you've seen in every single readout that we put out as well with the Secretary and Minister Gallant. So we're going to keep having those conversations. We're going to keep reiterating that. Just last, um, sure. does this further complicate getting the pier constructed? Does it show just how potentially dangerous and deadly it could be for anyone that's going to distribute aid that comes into that pier? Well, it's certainly something that, um, uh, you know, we're t we take into consideration when we're talking about our forces uh, that are going in to set up the pier. Now, we have received assurances. The chairman spoke to this. Um, you've seen other um, people across the administration also speak to this as well, that the Israelis have committed to providing some type of security for our forces, along with other, we expect other nations to also play a role in that. Um, I don't have more to provide at this time, but there's no higher priority than the protection of our forces. Um, that is something that the secretary and the president take very seriously, and they will be protected um, when they begin to start the setting up the J-Lots. Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh at her news conference at the Pentagon. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, Democrat from Washington State, chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, posting on X, the latest horror inflicted by Netanyahu's airstrikes on Gaza, killing brave souls at World Central Kitchen, delivering food to starving Palestinians. Another strike also killed at least 15 Palestinians at, in Rafah, including five children. We must stop U.S. military aid used for indiscriminate killing. At the White House, they say that the president also spoke with Chef Jose Andres and told him that he will convey to Israel that humanitarian aid workers must be protected. And the White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby, joining the briefing, asked about U.S. military aid to Israel. You described the, uh, the strike as a, a possible mistake by Israel. According to uh, Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, it wasn't one strike, but three. The first one, then an interval during which aid workers got out of their vehicles, removed the wounded, tried to move to another vehicle, which was struck, and then a third strike what as they tried to move and escape in a third vehicle, at which point all of them uh, were dead. How would the second and third strikes of these marked vehicles be a mistake? And why would the U.S. not more forcefully set conditions on the use of U.S.-made weaponry when it is being used to target aid workers. If the first one was a mistake, the second two were targeted with the intent of killing everyone in that convoy. So how do you respond to that? Uh, first of all, there's an investigation going on. So why don't we let it get done? And why don't we see what they find in terms of the decision-making process that led to this terrible outcome? The Prime Minister and the IDF have noted that it was their error. If you don't like the word mistake, their error. Uh, they're investigating it. Let them do that work and let them see what they come up with. Uh, and then we'll go from there. And, uh, sorry, one, one, one more, John. Uh, two years ago, uh, the IDF killed uh, an Al Jazeera journalist. They said that that was a, a mistake. 
uh, that she was wearing a Mark Press vest. She was shot anyway. They investigated it, and they uh, released the findings of their investigation, which found that they were at fault. Go they on. Uh, but my, my question, sir, is in that case, uh, these, the Israelis did not initiate any criminal uh, proceeding. In this case, if it's found that the marked convoy was deliberately targeted, if not with the first shot, but the second two shots, would the U.S. support uh, <coughs> criminal penalties? As I said, we would expect that uh, should there be a need for accountability, that account accountability be properly put in place for whoever may be responsible for this. But again, that's gonna, a lot of that's going to depend on the investigation. John Kirby, White House National Security Communications Advisor in the White House Briefing Room. The President of Israel, Isaac Herzog, posting that he initiated a phone call with the World Central Kitchen founder, Chef Jose Andres, and they write that President Herzog expressed his deep sorrow and sincere apologies over the tragic loss of life of WCK staff in the Gaza Strip last night and sent his condolences to their families and loved ones. The president reiterated Israel's commitment to ensuring a thorough investigation of the tragedy which occurred amidst the ongoing war against the terrorist organization Hamas. Iran asked the United Nations Security Council today to hold an emergency meeting about what the Iran Revolutionary Guard says was an Israeli airstrike that destroyed Iran's consulate in Damascus, Syria, that killed at least seven people, including civilians. Through a spokesperson, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned the attack, saying the principle of the inviolability of diplomatic and consular premises and personnel must be respected in all cases in accordance with international law. Here's part of today's U.N. Security Council meeting. Vasily Nebetsia is the Russian Federation ambassador to the U.N. You'll hear him through an interpreter. Madam President, we have carefully listened to today's statements from Western colleagues from the Troika of the permanent members of the Security Council, and we were once again struck by their cynicism and their double standards. From their verbal gymnastics today, it is very hard to understand why we gathered here today at all. The representative of France said everything except for a single word of condemnation for yet another violation of international law by Israel. What we're talking about is an intentional strike on a diplomatic premise. Colleagues, what if it was your embassy that were attacked or your consulate in the region? Would you respond in the same way? This is your rules-based order in all its glory. Vasily Nebetsia is the Russian ambassador to the United Nations through an interpreter today at the UN Security Council meeting. Representing the United States at the meeting, the deputy U.S. ambassador to the UN, Robert Wood. Even as we continue to learn more about this incident, it seems clear that every member of this council should reiterate that all states, including Iran and Syria, have a responsibility to avoid the path of escalation to stop arming and advising terrorist groups, and to rein in the actions of proxies who threaten regional peace and security. Madam President, two final points. I want to be clear. We do not yet have confirmation of the status of the building that was struck in Damascus. Any confirmed attack on property that was in fact a diplomatic facility would be of concern to the United States. Diplomatic missions and their property as well as official diplomatic residences, must be protected, even and especially in times of armed conflict. As I noted earlier, we are also concerned by reports that terrorist leaders and elements were allegedly pre present at this facility and condemn Iran's continued coordination, training, and arming of terrorists and other violent extremists. Robert Wood, the deputy U.S. ambassador to the U.N. at today's U.N. Security Council meeting in New York City. Times of Israel reports that Iran and Hezbollah vowed Tuesday to respond to a strike widely attributed to Israel that demolished Iran's consulate in Damascus and killed seven people, including two generals from Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, a U.S.-designated terrorist organization. 
And finally, from Fox News, President Joe Biden held a phone call with Chinese President Xi Jinping for the first time since July 2022. On Tuesday, the White House announced Biden and Xi were expected to discuss Taiwan, narcotics, artificial intelligence, and China's support for Russia against Ukraine. White House described the conversation as merely a check-in between the two leaders. That was the early reporting from Fox News. And then John Kirby, the White House National Security Communications Advisor, gave some more details at the news conference. As you all know, uh, President Biden spoke by phone today with President Xi, Xi Jinping of the People's Republic of China. The purpose of the call was to build on the two leaders' meeting in Woodside, California, back in November of last year. Over the course of about an hour and 45 minutes, the two leaders held a candid and constructive discussion on a range of bilateral, regional, and global issues, including areas of cooperation and areas of differences. They encouraged continued progress on issues discussed at the Woodside Summit, including counter-narcotics, cooperation, ongoing military-to-military communications, talks to address artificial intelligence-related risks, uh, and continuing efforts on climate change and people-to-people exchanges. President Biden also emphasized the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, and he reaffirmed the importance of the rule of law and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. He raised concerns over the PRC's support for Russia's defense industrial base and its impact on European and transatlantic security. And he emphasized that the United States is, uh, he emphasized the U.S.'s enduring commitment to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. President Biden also raised continued concerns about the PRC's unfair trade policies and non-market economic practices, which harm American workers and families. President Biden also emphasized that the United States will continue to take necessary actions to prevent advanced U.S. technologies from being used to undermine our national security without unduly limiting trade and investment. The president also repeated his call for China to release U.S. citizens who are wrongfully detained or under exit bans. We believe that there is no substitute for regular communication at the leader level to effectively manage this complex and often tense bilateral relationship. And both presidents agreed to pick up the phone and speak when needed. Following the leader's call, we will continue to advance our interests through cabinet-level diplomacy, including visits to uh, China by Secretary of the Treasury Yellen, and in coming days, I'm sorry, in coming days, and by Secretary Blinken uh, in coming weeks. John Kirby, the White House National Security Communications Advisor, today in the White House briefing room. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and you'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. Mm-hmm.